The following interview was conducted with Donna Lester, Executive Secretary, Ag Alumni Association for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, um, May the 12th, 2011, in uh, on campus in the Ag Administration Building. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. This is part two, so we'll pick it up um, your career path before you came to, to Purdue. Okay, Hi, well, good morning. Uh, good morning to you, Catherine. The uh, I think we talked about earlier about where that I had gone to school at the University of Georgia and had been active in livestock judging there. Um, that led me to an opportunity to go to graduate school. I went to Virginia Tech, got my master's degree in animal breeding and genetics there, and uh, that sounds pretty highfalutin, but it's just uh, uh, basically a population statistics degree. Uh, in of the, animals. Uh, well, population statistics are applicable to everything. True. So, uh, actually, I took a lot of statistics courses that were not in the animal science department for that degree, and a lot of experimental design, that sort of thing. So, um, was ready then. Now, that qualifies you to do a lot of analytical work, and I was lucky to uh, get a job at the International Brangus Breeders Association. Uh, they were located in San Antonio, Texas. And I got the job, as most of us get our jobs, uh, through networking. Uh, one of my professors from the University of Georgia, who interestingly enough had his master's and PhD in breeding and genetics from Virginia Tech, uh, Larry Beneshek, uh, was a professor of animal sciences at the University of Georgia at the time. And Larry was, uh, at that time, doing sire summaries for lots of the major cattle breeds. The Brangus breed didn't have a sire summary at the time, but they hired Larry to do their first one. They needed a staff member, and he called me and said, I would like to recommend you to them you know, for the job. He said, it's sort of like this. They need somebody who has the technical skills. Um, they don't have enough money to hire a PhD. Uh, so I thought you'd be perfect. You've got the skills with your master's, but not the, the PhD uh, uh, salary requirements. So um, I was interviewed. Um, uh, Jerry Morrow was the uh, executive vice president at the time, and Jerry hired me onto that staff. And uh, my job was to work with the Brangus breeders to produce their first ever sire summary. And we were successful in doing that. Larry, of course, produced it. Uh, we provided the data, and he produced it there at the University of Georgia with their facilities. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. It was a small staff. We were very young staff. Probably the average age was about 26. Um, our executive vice president was the only person in the building that was over 50. And um, from the receptionist on up, I mean, we were just a very young staff. It was also very small staff, and you got to do a lot of things when you're on a small staff. So it was a great first job because I got a lot of experience in how to manage a project um, and how to do all of it because you didn't have uh, all of these specialists to call on like you do at a big institution like Purdue where you outsource things, to, uh, effectively you outsource to other departments. And uh, so it was, it was a great experience. I uh, stayed there for about two and a half years. Like I said, we got the very first sire summary out. I did a lot of presentations. Um, that was calling on my 4-H skills and my livestock judging skills and all of those things to put together presentations to teach people what the sire summary was all about and how to use it because this was all new to this population of people. So it was a, a wonderful uh, time of my life, a great camaraderie with the staff, made friends that have been lifelong friends. In fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, one of my colleagues from there brought her son and I had the wonderful uh, pleasure of showing him around campus. He's looking to attend Purdue. Uh, they live in Kansas, and so I was thrilled that these kinds of connections are now coming home to roost for Purdue and feeling like that my personal engagement with people um, makes a little bit of a difference for Purdue, and that always feels good, you know, to, to know that, that you have that. So I was there for two and a half years and um, really needed new challenges and, and thinking about moving on. Actually was thinking of going to law school. I went to the American Society of Animal Science meetings in Athens. Um, I think that would have been the summer of 1985. 
and I was going to go after a session over to the law school to check on admissions requirements, what I would need to do and, and whatever. And as the session ended, and again, one of my former professors from the University of Georgia corners me and says, what are you doing this afternoon? And I said, well, not much. I've got a couple things I want to see on campus. He said, well, I have a job that I want to talk to you about. Okay, he said, I've been meaning to call you, just haven't gotten around to it. Can you come over to my office and talk about it? They were creating uh, a development officer position, a fundraiser for the College of Agriculture there. And they were, uh, it was going to be a, a prototype for the university. Uh, university of Georgia at that time, this was 1985, did not have fundraisers for their schools and colleges. And they were going to allow the law school and the ag school to create their own and they would be joint staffed and whatever so he said he thought I would be great for this job. Well we talked about it and since I was kind of ready for a challenge and a new change I, I agreed that I would uh, put my application in. Got an interview and I was not hired and so I came back to San Antonio thinking I was still looking for a job and actually several months passed and I got to the place uh, that I just knew I was going to have to, you know, move and make a change. And I got a phone call the day after I made that decision. The morning, the next morning, my phone rings there at the Brangus Association. And it was my professor from the University of Georgia, Louis Boyd. And he and, an, and one of the associate vice presidents were offering me the position. The person they had offered it to had declined. Interestingly enough, he was an attorney, and so there I thought about going to law school and how this would play into a career path was, uh, I, I thought, well, was very, um, was interesting there. So I, he said, you know, we want to offer you the position. I said, I'm still interested. We talked. They offered me the position. I went to the University of Georgia, started in April of 1986, and lots of changes happened. Uh, they had lots of political stuff going on there, and the president uh, was leaving uh, between the time they hired me and the time I got there. Uh, all kinds of things happened, and so the administration who had set this plan in place for all of these development officers was all of a sudden going to be gone. So we knew that there would be changes in a couple of years, and, and there were. Uh, ultimately, the new vice president that was hired uh, decided he didn't like this model. But by then, there were some other things going on in our college. And so the dean offered me uh, the opportunity to do ag alumni work. And that turned out to be a very fortuitous day in my life uh, because he said he had promised the Ag Alumni Association at the University of Georgia that when their uh, executive secretary, uh, their director retired, um, he would hire a full-time person. She was a half-time staff member. She did not travel. She just handled their office business. So he said, I'll have you do that because by then my salary was all the College of Agriculture he could do with me as he chose. And it wasn't long after that, she was still on staff, and so he said, you can work with her and transition before she retires, and she had about a year left probably then. Somebody else left, and they did student recruitment. And so the associate dean for student, or for student programs uh, talked to the dean, and they decided that I should do that too. So all of a sudden, I had all of these jobs that I had to do. I had two offices in the same building, two secretaries, and so it was a really, really hectic, busy time for the next couple of years. But along the way, I had done something really neat, and not of my own choosing, but because Louis Boyd made me go, basically, 1986 when he hired me. He said, you need to go. And he said, I've been to these meetings for this group, uh, this national professional group, the National Ag Alumni and Development Association. It's known as NADA. He said, you need to go to their conventions and find out what um, they think about doing this fundraising work at that point in time. So I went, and the first conference I went to was just a few weeks after I was hired at Georgia. Uh, the summer of 1986 was in Champaign, Illinois. Didn't know a soul there. Walked in. I did, wasn't happy to be there. Didn't know anybody. Felt just like a, a fish out of water. And this man, I, as I tell the story, I said, this old man walks up to me and puts his arm around me and says, 
You're that new kid from Georgia, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, I'm Maury Williamson from Purdue University. He said, come sit at my table and let's talk about what you need to do. Well, and as they say, the rest was history because for four years, Maury was my mentor in this job. He was thrilled when I got the opportunity to do ag alumni work at the University of Georgia, but he had connected me with development colleagues around the country. I had visited Mike Ritchie at the University of Kentucky through this professional group trying to figure out how we should structure things there at Georgia. Maury was a wonderful, wonderful mentor. So long about 1989, he said, you know, I'm going to be retiring next year. You really ought to apply for my job. He said, they won't hire you, uh, but you'll get a trip to Indiana out of it at least. And a meal probably. Right? Yeah. And everybody who knows Maury can laugh and know that's exactly what he told me. And he's told the story probably a hundred times at dinner meetings. And I've probably told it an equal number of times. And it's the honest to God truth. That's how it happened. So he brought the search committee, actually, to the 1989 NADA conference out at Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, Dean Bob Thompson came and several of the alumni members of the search committee, Dave Voris from Windfall, Indiana, and Bob, um, Don Vilwock from down at Edwards Port, and then Terry Street, who was here on campus. Terry lives in Lafayette. They were all officers, uh, actually were in the presidential track. They were the past, current, and future presidents of Ag Alumni, and they all came out there. I was a presenter at the conference. They saw me there. They talked to other people. That was that, and that was in the summer, and then the fall came, and they had applications. I applied and didn't hear anything from them until about Christmas time, and they called and said they wanted to interview me. They interviewed me in January of 1990 on Thursday before the Ag Fish Fry. Now, I was already coming to the Ag Fish Fry. That was going to be my first one because it was Maury's last one. And our NADA colleagues from around the country have a winter board meeting. I was chair of the first awards committee for that national group. Mike Ritchie, the development colleague who had helped me so much in the beginning, he was president of NOT at the time, and Mike held the board meeting in West Lafayette so all of us could go to Maury's last fish fry. Perfect, so I told Don when he asked, Don Vilwalk called and asked about the interview schedule, and I said, well, I'm going to be in West Lafayette anyway. I can just extend it, come early, and we'll interview on Thursday. First person that I met when I got on campus. I came in on probably on Wednesday night, and I, I don't remember the details. I was staying at the Union Hotel, but I know that I didn't have a dinner or anything. Thursday morning, I was waiting in the lobby, and another Purdue icon, Tom Turpin, is the one who picked me up and took me to my interview. And I, I tell you all this for this history project because it's so interesting that so many people who are just true Purdue legends were involved in my hiring and in bringing me to Purdue. So Tom was on the search committee. He was a past president of the Purdue Ag Alumni Association and an interesting thing there, he's the only person to ever be president of Purdue Ag Alumni who was not a graduate of Purdue. So that turns out to be key later on too because Tom met me, took me to the interview, what was supposed to be an hour or so interview turned into half a day. We uh, interviewed over at a restaurant in Lafayette, finished up the interview. I was with Tom, so I had to go with Tom. Well, Tom was on the fish fry committee, and he had three or four errands he had to run for the fish fry, and they were the silliest things that he was getting, and I just didn't even understand what this was all about. Of course, the next morning when I went to the fish fry, it all became clear. That afternoon, the dean had invited me to come over to just stop in the building, see what it was like over in the building if I wanted to. And I walked over from Stewart Center after my meetings were over. And I will never forget, I honestly had to hold on to a light pole out at the corner of Marsteller and State because the wind was blowing so hard, I thought it was going to blow me into the street. And I thought, oh my God, I can't work here. This, this just won't work. And fortunately, the Chicago Tribune was in the, a newspaper box at the Union Club Hotel. 
and they had pictures on the front page of people being windblown on the streets of Chicago. And I thought, okay, if this is newsworthy in Chicago, this can't be normal. <laughs> this cannot be normal. So I, I settled myself down, went to the fish fry the next day, saw the spectacle that was the ag fish fry over in the armory, uh, got to see them say goodbye to Maury, give him the certificate of distinction, uh, which he had awarded to so many people over the years. And he got the this, this certificate of distinction that day. And I left early. Uh, Bill Sheets was the development director for the college. Bill's wife, Larabeth, took me out to the Purdue airport. They still had commercial service back then. And I flew out to the Washington, D.C. area to visit a friend of mine for the weekend. By the time I got to her apartment that evening and called my home and checked my messages, because we didn't have cell phones back then either, I called and checked my messages at home. I had two messages from Dean Bob Thompson telling me that they wanted a second interview. Well, I was delighted because I really, really love these people. And I came to the uh, second interview. Uh, it was the weekend of their Ag Alumni Board meeting in February down in Indianapolis. And it was their sweetheart's dinner. They invited their spouses for dinner. They had their board meeting in the afternoon and then the spouses uh, came in for dinner. And so they said, we'll interview there. Uh, David Myers from down at Greensburg, Indiana, was uh, on the board. He was a past president. And David was the deputy commissioner of agriculture for Indiana at the time. And he arranged for a conference room downtown. That's where the interview took place. Now, this was also a different time and place that you could fly into some place in the morning and figure you could get there because planes weren't as crowded and there were lots more flights. So I scheduled... For a critical interview like that now, I would never fly in the morning of. I did that that morning. We'd had tornadoes in Georgia. And just a terrible morning, but I got here on time. But I had a little wardrobe malfunction that morning. Everybody has their navy blue hire me suit. Well, I put pulled my navy blue hire me suit out of the dry cleaning bag, and it had brass buttons on it. The dry cleaner had scratched up those glass those brass buttons and I thought that just doesn't look very nice well I had another suit just like it in the uh, different color in the closet and I already had all my other clothes on I thought well that other suit will work it's cut the same way I can wear it so I pulled it out and I thought oh well this will work it's their sweetheart's dinner this will be nice it's Valentine's Day weekend and so I proceeded to Indiana to interview for the job of executive secretary of Purdue Ag alumni wearing a bright red suit and a cream colored blouse didn't have a clue about the fashion faux pas that this was I get off the plane in Indianapolis Don and Joyce Vilwalk meet me there at the gate Don's mouth dropped open and he's shaking his head and I can see he's not happy and he's worried and I'm thinking what have I haven't said anything yet what's wrong and I, I ask him and he's just shaking his head and he said Donya he said this will never do and I said what will never do and he just pointed to my outfit and he said Donya I use colors are cream and crimson it'll only work one time in your career but I looked at him and I said what's I you <laughs> I really didn't know anything about that rivalry. I had researched the college here. I hadn't researched rivalries and that sort of thing. That wasn't part of, of what I had done. So I went downtown to do this interview. They set me up standing in the doorway of the boardroom as everybody entered. So it was pretty much like a receiving line. And 25 or so people were involved in that interview that day. It was the full board. And I shook hands with each one of them with the greeting. Hello, I'm Danya. Lovely to meet you. So sorry about the suit. And I said it identically to every person who came in the room. It was a grand day. Um, the interview was interesting. Uh, another Purdue icon involved in that was David Fenler. He was part, he was an emeritus member of the board of Ag Alumni. So David Fenler was involved in the interview. Now, in the intervening couple of weeks from when they had interviewed me first, 
Maury had had the job of telling people that they were going to interview a woman for the Ag Alumni Executive Secretary. Now back in 1990, College of Agriculture, they didn't have any women administrators, didn't have any women department heads. It was a whole different deal. Mm -hmm. And so he laughed about, you know, telling all these people this. Well, as it turns out, the fact I was a woman wasn't really the big issue for people. Now, they had they were stunned that Purdue was going to interview me and, and that and then later that Purdue had offered me the job. But it really wasn't about my being a woman. If you talked to people, it turns out it was a very valid concern. They were worried because I wasn't a Purdue grad. That was the uncommon part. At the time I got the job here, and they, they offered me the job on the spot that day after that second interview. Um, Don Vilwalk, Terry Stree, and Bob Thompson took me to a, a little private room and, and off, made the offer to me uh, I, after I had been dismissed to go shopping with the wives while they discussed this. But Dave Fenler apparently was one of the people who was very opposed to the idea of hiring me. And Dave apparently had some talking points on a little slip of paper in his inside coat pocket. But David asked me one of the first questions when they opened it up. And the question he asked me had nothing to do with ag alumni. It had to do with Angus cattle. Because one thing David loved as much as Purdue was Angus cattle. Well, Brangus cattle are derived from Angus. And so I knew a lot about Angus bloodlines. I knew a lot about Angus cattle. And when he asked me the question, which I can't remember to this day what it was, <laughs> mm -hmm. I answered the question. He was satisfied. He never pulled his talking points out. He never made one objection, they said, when they were discussing it out of my presence. I was told David never made one objection to it. Several weeks after I was hired, we went to the National Ag Alumni meetings. It, it turned out it was... Uh, one of the it was the last one that Dave Fenler would attend. He was one of the founders of that national professional organization. He and Maury Williamson had helped to found that group where I met Maury, the thing that connected me to Purdue, the reason I got hired at Purdue, the place where the search committee first met me, all of these people at Purdue laid the groundwork for an organization that brought me here ultimately. So it, it really was great how that all worked together. But this, uh, this national group um, has turned out to be so very important in my career and in my life because I became president of that group uh, five years after I came to Purdue. I was one of the youngest presidents of the national organization at the time. And it was just an incredible experience that I had to lead my profession uh, before I was 35. And uh, so it, it, it was really wonderful that I, I had these opportunities. And, and it would have never happened had it not been for these these people who are truly legends. They were so cred they had such levels of integrity and established credibility and that they lent that to me, this kid who came to Purdue. It was so great. And uh, Tom Turpin, I said that played into things. In those weeks when people were doubting what the sanity was of, of interviewing me and then after they made the offer and I accepted the, the sanity of hiring me before I ever got here, I heard that there were lots of things done on my behalf. And one of them was Tom Turpin because people trusted Tom. And anyone who expressed their displeasure to him, Tom was quick to rebut it with, well, you know, I don't have a Purdue degree. Do you think that I'm not all about Purdue, and that would quiet them. Maury Williamson would use that example. He'd say, well, what kind of person, if you, you don't think we should have gotten that, what kind of person would be great to lead ag alumni? He said 90% of the people would say, well, you need somebody like Tom Turpin. And he says, well, guess what? Tom doesn't have a Purdue degree either. And if Danya comes to Purdue, she will be just like Tom. She will have made the choice to be part of us. And there's not a reason in the world it can't be successful. 
Catherine, I can't tell you how much those things have meant to me in my early career in terms of my success. These guys should have written a book about a successful transition from a legend to an unknown and to an unknown that had strikes against them. Because young, not from Purdue, and oh, by the way, she's also a woman. I, I had two big strikes and one little one against me. And the woman thing turned out to be the little one. And, and I knew it was going to, I thought it was going to be very, very hard. I told my mother, I said, you know, the first year in this job at Purdue will be the hardest year of my life. But if I get through it and people have the opportunity to get to know me, I think we'll get along okay. The hard stuff never happened. Because all these people, Maury Williamson took one, he had two retirement receptions. The only guy in Indiana that was had so many friends, you had to do two retirement receptions. We had one over in the ballrooms at, at the Memorial Union, and we had one down at the state fairgrounds in the Farm Bureau building. The one over at the Memorial <coughs> Union, Maury used the entire night to introduce me to Indiana people, to Purdue people, and they saw me standing at his side all night long. He would come over and touch me on the elbow if I'd been talking to somebody for a little bit and say, you've been talking to them long enough. Come on, I have someone else for you to meet. Maury was just incredible in transferring his authority to lead this organization to me. Um, I don't think anybody ever gave him enough credit for that. I think that what he did was a remarkably unselfish act. Uh, it was a remarkable act of service to this university. And I have, it was a remarkable act of friendship to me and one I have never forgotten. And I, I dearly, dearly love him. And I don't use that word lightly. One day he called a few years ago and I laughed when, after I realized what we had said because as he hung up, he said, I love you, kid. I said, I love you too. And I thought, how many people have that kind of relationship with their predecessor, with a professional colleague, and we are professional colleagues. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a, we work together on so many things, but there is such a degree of, of respect and genuine affection between us. I hope that I have been a good custodian of what he built because he did things in this job that people still just yeah. marvel at. The day I walked into the job at Purdue, there were things in place that had I stayed at the University of Georgia, if I'd worked for 20 years, I would have been lucky to get them to the place that Purdue was the day I started. And I, you know, people would say, well, why did you want to move to Purdue? Why did you want to come to Indiana? You didn't know anybody. I said, quite simply, if I'm going to do this kind of work, I want to do it where they do it well. And there was a culture that supported this. I've had now four deans in 21 years that I've been here, four deans that I could not have asked for better support from. Uh, it is just truly part of the culture here that this college values our alumni. It values external stakeholders broadly. And we give them ownership of programs around here. And oh my goodness, have they paid us back. They have done things for us that my colleagues around the country can't believe the things that, that people do for us. But it's because we have administrators who have supported the idea of giving the stakeholders ownership, true ownership. That's a risk. It's, it's a true risk when you do that, but the fact that they have been willing to take that risk, oh my goodness, I, I, it's, it's amazing. Vic Lechtenberg, when he was my dean, Bob Thompson was the dean who hired me. I worked for Bob for about three years, and he left um, to go to, uh, uh, I think he, he left first to go to Winrock. And then um, later, he's just retired now, this is 2011, he just retired in 2010 from a, uh, um, an endowed professorship over at the University of Illinois in international agriculture. 
Bob had worked very hard to internationalize the curriculum of the College of Agriculture. And so one of the things that I did in those first three years or so that I worked for him was that I really tried to uh, position ag alumni programs to support that effort. Uh, there was a lot of resistance to that in the beginning. Uh, a lot of people didn't understand what our international programs were all about, why we were doing this, and Bob was a great champion of this, but we also had great data points to tell people about and things that made a difference. Uh, Central Soya, a great Indiana company at the time, was bought out by an Italian company. And uh, the president I mean, of uh, Central Soya told Bob Thompson that he would have lost his job had he not been able to speak French. Now he was bought by an Italian company but he would have lost his job as president of this Indiana grain company had he not been able to speak French because that was the only language that the board of directors had in common and so all the board meetings were conducted in French. When we would tell that story, Bob told the story and I replicated it hundreds of times at all these ag alumni meetings all around the state because back then I had 40 plus chapters of ag alumni who were doing meetings uh, at least once a year, some of them like Delaware County and Blackford County, Knox County, some of those that were more active, would have as many as three or four meetings during the year. And so I was traveling all over the state, and so I had a great opportunity to personally champion the programs of the dean, and that's really all that ag alumni is, is the the vehicle to build volunteer leadership for the objectives of the dean. We don't have dues. Uh, we exist to support the college. And so with Bob's tenure, supporting that internationalization was key. And, you know, we would tell those stories night after night, or I would tell them. I was usually the one telling that story uh, after I had heard it from Bob. And it, it made a difference. We had students that were in transfer programs, and I remember when uh, the Iron Curtain first uh, started coming down and these uh, uh, countries that had formerly been in the Soviet bloc, the first thing they wanted was agriculture technology and so they were coming here. One of the things that we were able to do is that we put together some exchange programs uh, for our undergraduate students and one of the earliest ones we had in that period of time was uh, in Ukraine. I took a group of Ukrainian students. I, we had Our students had just been to Ukraine for the summer, and I took some of them, and then the Ukrainian students were at Purdue fall semester, and I took a group of them, and I never will forget, I loaded a van. This is back when we could still take 15 passenger vans out on the road, and I don't even know how many students I had packed in that van that night, but I hauled a van load of Purdue and Ukrainian students to Delaware County, Indiana, to a meeting in a barn at a farm. And our students told about their experiences, very poignant experiences. And the Ukrainians told about their experiences. And our people, as they sat there in that barn that night, started figuring out why we were doing what we were doing. It all comes together, but I'm so proud that Ag Alumni was able to play a part in that, and I truly think it would have taken a lot longer for our, our alumni out in the state to have appreciated and really rallied behind what we were doing had it not been for the work we did in Ag Alumni. So I, I'm really proud that in those early years we did that. But when Bob left, Vic Lechtenberg became dean, and I worked at this point in time. Vic's the dean I've worked for the longest because I worked for him for ten years, and uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful relationship. Vic was so supportive of what we did. Um, Vic really uh, was one. Bob had lots of contacts in Washington, but Vic was really one who worked. Uh, our federal connections, our, uh, our legislative connections. Vic really uh, worked hard at that. And so I worked a little harder at connecting our alumni to that. And so that's the period of time, kind of at the end of Bob's tenure, beginning of Vic's, where we were beginning to do more out-of-state alumni receptions, that kind of thing. Of course, over time, these um, county chapters began to dry up. 
because 1990 people didn't have the things on their plate that they have here in 2011 in terms of uh, their children's activities and all of the sports and whatever. So things just changed. And uh, one of my colleagues at our national association asked me one time, it's amazing, I always loved our chapters, I loved doing it, my colleagues thought I was crazy. They couldn't understand. They wouldn't. They wouldn't have done what I did. And I thought, well, and that's why you wouldn't work at Purdue. But uh, I, I loved what I did. And uh, the first few years I was at Purdue, I had a secretary who used to calculate what, uh, how many days out I was out of the office. The first few years I was at Purdue, every year when she'd do the calculation, it would come up the same exactly half of my work days. 2.5 nights a week, I had a dinner somewhere outside of this campus. And, and of course, they didn't come two and a half nights a week. Uh, June was busy, September was busy. Now the farming has changed. You can't, I mean, June and September are incredibly busy for farmers, but the first September I was at Purdue, I had 17 dinner meetings that first month, uh, that first September. And uh, so it was just, just an incredible time. Um, you know, those are some of the things I guess I'm, I'm proudest of that, that we've done. Um, being able to keep Maury as the curator of our Pioneer Farm and Home Show down at the Indiana State Fair for a number of years. Maury's just been retired from that for a few years. Um, we have partnered with the Indiana State Fair to have Tim Nanette. Uh, Tim was a former president of Ag Alumni. He had worked with Maury for 25 years or more down at the State Fair since he was a kid. And he's just been a great asset to us. So he's taken over as the next generation of leadership for the Pioneer Farm Show. Maury still goes and is active. Oh, sure. But those are the things, I guess, that, that I'm the proudest, the proudest of as far as what we have done. Um, in keeping the programs um, alive because I was very different. I didn't have that personality or, or interest or background to manage that and do the job that needed doing down there. And it was a really wonderful thing that Maury was willing to do it. Uh, we've had another person as Maury uh, uh, probably for the last 10 or maybe longer ago than that, more than 10 years, uh, Wayne Dillman from Martinsville, a uh, former board member of Ag Alumni, uh, formerly with Indiana Farmers Union uh, for many years. He was the uh, legislative person for Indiana Farmers Union and, and is retired from that and is now working for Indiana Farm Bureau as a, as a, le uh, a uh, lobbyist. But Wayne took over some of those duties and shared them with Maury, and now he is the chief interpreter of all the threshing shows and whatever. And so we really were able to maintain that uh, with the talent of others, not mm -hmm. the talent of the executive secretary. For so long it had been tied to my position. Now my position is really the administrative part of Ag Alumni, and that's one of our programs, and we have both paid staff and volunteers who, who we recruit to do that. And interestingly, this year, 2011, is the 50th anniversary of that program. And so I've got a lot of things going on this year planning the 50th for that. But in 1961, Maury put together his first exhibit of tools. It was just a little tool exhibit down at the State Fair, and that was the beginning of the Pioneer Farm and Home Show. Um, so I think we've really, this has been, you really covered a lot, which is okay. really, it was really great. Um, want, did want to ask you, you mm -hmm. that certificate, um, certificate, you mentioned about that, mm -hmm. um, but really the liaison and, and all of this, mm -hmm. um, how about, I tell you one thing, hobbies. Oh, my first. Any, I'd well, rather talk about Purdue there stuff. There you go. <laughs> well, and how about a Purdue tradition since uh, you've been here? Oh, the well, you it? know. Well, I tell you what, I've learned how to wear gold and black together because coming from the University of Georgia, that wasn't something I was accustomed to. And I, I didn't, have never... Didn't they, don't they wear their school colors down there? 
Yeah, but we, but it's not gold and black. Oh, I know that. Gold I and black that. was our rival. I and know. so that was okay. the part, that wearing gold and black together was something <laughs> I had to learn how to do because that was our rival at the University of Georgia. But, um, no, it, it's been fun to see because, you know, when I came, the griffin was the symbol of Purdue. I still love the griffin. I do, too. Um, I think it's just, and, and in fact, people laugh because I like the old griffin that was the griffin before I came. And so I have, uh, actually, one of my alums found an old plaster cast mold of the old griffin, which I have in, uh, in the Ag Alumni Archives. Another one of my alumni, six, seven hundred miles away, brought in one day a cast of the old griffin made from that plaster cast that my alum in Terre Haute had brought oh to my me. Oh, Lord. How wonderful. I and so it. I have that old griffin uh, on top of the file cabinet there in my office. But, uh, yeah, just those things I love. And I love that people value Purdue so much that if you're willing, in our job, and, and the College of Agriculture, I think, is special. I think we have a tradition probably because of extension and the land grant mission, we have a connection with our alumni that I don't think is universal. It's, it's unique. It's closer. Yeah, it's 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 different. It's it's different than it is in other colleges, and, and I I think that it's probably from that land grant and the extension. Right. But our people had such trust in the institution that my personality didn't. Well, my personality mattered. They wanted me to care. But it didn't matter who it was so long as that person did their job and cared about Purdue and cared about them. And I, I think in 21 years they figured out that I do and they trust me. Um, it helped. In 1995, I married one of them. Uh, I married a Purdue Ag alum, uh, Dan Gwynn from down at Linden. And so that, that gave me instant credibility. Dan also farms, so that gave me credibility in the farming community. And you would just love this because Millard Plumley, who's retired from Purdue, Millard was a Rotarian. I was in Rotary at the time. And I went to Rotary the week after I got married. And Millard had always just politely tolerated me, and sometimes not so politely, but he did tolerate me. And uh, I went to Rotary that Tuesday after marrying Dan, and all of a sudden I was Millard's best friend. I had married an Indiana farmer. I had married a Purdue grad, and so I was okay. I think they figured out then I wasn't going to move off and leave them. You know, I was vested in Indiana. I was vested in Purdue at that point in time. And so, you know, hobbies for me uh, really just uh, I love to travel with my husband. Um, I love anything involved with him. I've really loved learning about production agriculture through him. And so while that seems like a job, to me it's been really fun as a hobby to, to learn about that. Sounds good. Um, I like to garden, you know, I love that. I mean, I like having my hands in the dirt in a different way than my husband, so uh, that's I the thing. I think that's um, good. Yeah. Um, the favorite thing I love about uh, Purdue, um, gosh, so many things. I think... Uh, <sighs> Wow, let's see. Favorite Purdue tradition would be I think for me it's it's not just a single tradition. It's the culture of how Purdue conducts commencement. I cannot tell you how moving that that is and how valuable I think that is for this institution that our registrar's office makes sure that our May graduates get their real diploma on commencement day, that we split those ceremonies down and bring them in 6,000 people at a time so that parents can see their children and that graduates shake the dean's hand, they shake the president's hand. I graduated in a football stadium and people sitting on a stage down on the field instructed my group to stand up and move our tassels from one side to the other. That was the extent of my graduation. I remember the day, but that's it. People are moved 
by what we do here at yeah, Purdue. Here at and I've been pleased that our college, one of the things that I, I feel very personally proud of is that we changed to a much more significant reception for our graduates during my tenure. Uh, we now have a very big event over in the ross Aid Pavilion, entertain our students and their families up in the suites where they, not everybody gets to go up there. And to get to do it on the day you get your Purdue diploma, I think just is really special. They can take cap and gown photos with Mackie and uh, uh, ross Aid in the background. They've invested a lot in us. We invest a lot in them when budgets issues came up this year, uh, last year, and I asked the dean, uh, Jay Ackridge is my dean now, and I said, Jay, is this something we need to look at? It's very expensive. And do we need to think about changing it in any way to save costs? He said, absolutely not. This is too important. And he said, we will cut a lot of things before we cut that. And I thought, once again, I'm working for a dean that values that. Like I say, I've worked for four in between. I don't think I mentioned Randy Woodson was there for a few years until Randy uh, moved up and became provost here at Purdue. And uh, so I, I just have been so blessed to work with people who value our alumni, who value our stakeholders. And so it has made my job easy here. Uh, I've always had budgetary support. Um, I've never had a budget. I'm going to have a budget for the first time this year. Can you believe that? 21 years. Um, I have ag alumni resources that are separate, but the Purdue money, I asked Vic Lechtenberg one time, He, I had a new idea, and we did this big event, and I said, well, what's my budget? And he said, whatever it takes. He said, you've never wasted our money before, and I don't expect you'll start now. He said, you spend what we need to spend to make it look like I want it to look. When people come to our things, they need to feel like that we were prepared for them, that we welcomed them, that they were our guests, and that they are part of something that is successful. And he said, you know how to generate that feel. And he said, whatever it takes. He said, if you get uncomfortable about how much it's costing, come back and talk to me. But he said, as long as you're comfortable with it, don't worry about it. I thought, and again, I was so young. I was so young to have that kind of confidence from administrators. So the culture, the administrative support that this university puts into this job is just just incredible. I think you've done it really nice and, in, and given a very good view, really. And you're going to be around for a while, which is great. I hope. Okay. I hope. Great. I hope we can Thank do this you, again. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Very. You know, um, in another ten years.